Hey, it's another week. It's another another pop and play. Get excited. I'm I'm always excited. So basically all season and we've been talking about intergenerational relationships and yeah. part of that is listening to each other. Uh, are you and me listening to each other? No. Okay, Children and God. adults and okay. across generations listening to each other right, and right, hearing right. people out. Yes. Yes. That is a that's a big part of what we've been discussing and, and how we how generations share with one another about their interests and their lives through media. Yeah. Um, so on that note, let's talk <laughs> about going bonkers. <laughs> Nathan, tell us about this going bonkers piece that totally, we both love. Totally normal segue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like you're the one who should really introduce it because I think I've told you this before. You're the one who introduced this article to me. Oh, no I way. had not heard of this article until you shared it with me. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, this is kind of. I know that. The, okay. You were the origin of this, of the going bonkers article. Oh my gosh. Okay. So tell us, tell us about going bonkers. Well, okay. So going bonkers is a chapter. I think it's a chapter from a from a larger book by um, uh, Henry Jenkins, who's like, you would call him like a media pop culture scholar. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. At USC, I believe. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and so basically what he did was he gathered his son, who was five at the time, and a bunch of his friends to watch them watch television and specifically Pee Wee's Playhouse. Right. Um, and so he basically- Which, yes, I mean- for our listeners, I mean, our, our listeners are of a certain generation, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So I suspect most of them know what Pee Wee's Playhouse is. But if you don't know what Pee Wee's Playhouse is, it's kind of a an insane variety show. Um, Pee Wee Herman was, you know, obviously the main character and he was surrounded by a lot of kind of... Um, uh, sometimes people that were kind of would come by in costume, sometimes inanimate objects that also happen to be characters. Like I distinctly remember the, the chair named Cherry, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cherry. <laughs> it was his good buddy. <laughs> yep. Right. And all Lawrence these other Fishburne, the whatever he was, I forgot, like a cowboy or a. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, it was like a, it was a kid show, but it was like a kid show if you took the idea of a kid show and you cranked it up to an 11. I mean, it was just kind of off the walls crazy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Which I loved. Yeah. I like remember so, very distinct parts of it that, you know, like I love, like he would have this giant aluminum foil ball yeah. and basically he would like <laughs> roll it over and it's like gigantic. And he would like, people would come to his house and gift him a piece of aluminum foil to add on to the aluminum foil ball, which is actually really cool. I just like, I loved it because as an adult looking back on it, it was like the epitome of just like, Everything was like not linear. It was a sideways. It was like yeah, this queer space angles. before queer spaces became cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. like it was just like a very cool thing. But, um, and so he just kind of watched um, the kids watch Pee Wee Herman. And basically, I think he said that going bonkers is basically like how the kids describe themselves <laughs> watching Pee Wee Herman. We're just going bonkers, right? And so they're just like not even really paying attention to the television screen. They're just like screaming, running back and forth, going to the bathroom, eating snacks, like sometimes watching for a second, then starting to laugh and then playing games and doing all of these other things. And basically at the end of the day, they're just like enacting what the spirit of Pee Wee's Playhouse yeah, is. Like, yeah. let's not all do the same thing. Let's just be nuts and let's just go bonkers. So that was the chapter in a nutshell, right? Yeah, yeah. But he goes he goes into some depth also about sort of the ways in which the forms that the play takes starts to represent um, the various kinds of interests of the kids or, or particular needs of the kids or ways in which kids are kind of testing their identities, testing their boundaries. And so this form of media which was very popular, um, but also something that I think parents kind of in general were a little skeptical, a little confused by, a little unsure mm -hmm. of, because of, as you notice, sort of the, the kind of queerness of the space, um, how it, all, you know, it, it, this, it was a child's space and it was a child's space mm -hmm. to work about, work out child issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also like, I think the idea that play is all of those things, like really yeah. confusing, complex, messy, no one understands it. It's like just this like joyful space that you can't even describe really because <laughs> it's just like, it's never going to happen like that ever again. It's just going bonkers. Yeah, going bonkers, yeah. exactly. So yeah, so that was the idea of it. So let's tell the audience why we were even <laughs> talking about going bonkers. Right, <laughs> other than the fact that it's just a delightful read. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a number of years ago, 
Henry Jenkins uh, wrote a, a blog post where he invited his son, who is now an adult, to read the article, the original article, and then kind of they had a conversation together about this piece and about you know the memory of, of his son of this experience, um, his sort of reflection on does this research sound right, all of those kinds of things, and it kind of got us thinking about um, the ways in which we often are really interested in you know, kind of continuing those relationships with the kids that we work with, um, the ways in which we, we often kind of wonder the extent to which the research that we do, how it, how it reflects what we think we're reflecting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, both of us do research that we, where we like really get in there with kids. Like we really engage with them as people and we spend time with them and we, you know, kind of explore their interests. It's not like we're these, you know, outsiders who are trying to, to not touch, not affect, not be part of the research. So, mm-hmm. When you're part of the research, you also kind of develop these sort of relationships, friendships, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So that sort of revisited idea, I think was really intriguing. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I always wonder, like, I always imagine, what if this kid picked up this article that I wrote like five years later, what would they think about it? And I, sometimes I imagine like, oh, I wrote this about this kid when he was six, now he's 11. So I wonder what he would think about what he said here. And it's like almost this weird thing that their, their actions when they were five years old are like basically sedimented on this piece of paper, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. For all time. And like, it's, it's interesting because the article doesn't change. The, the kids do change. Right. Yeah. So in that revisited piece, Henry Jr. kind of talks about that, like the unsettling sort of like weird, it's like weird to read about yourself as a 30 year old versus as a five, when you were five, you didn't really care what was on this piece of paper. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that is like really fascinating. And I think one of the things he said is that when he read it, it was like really unsettling because he had so much distance from that yeah. five year old yeah. version of himself and he doesn't recognize who that is. Huh. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting take on it. I mean, I feel like it's like, as researchers or edu- not even researchers, right? Just anybody who is in any kind of vicinity with kids where we're responsible for hearing them out in some way, whether it's a teacher, child, adult, or parent, caregiver, child, whether it's a researcher and the research, whatever you want to call that. Like I think there's this responsibility to hear these young people out and I'm not, sometimes I have to question whether I've really heard them fully. Right. Um, And I think that's been something that I've been thinking about more and more. Because I think when you start off as a researcher, you're just like so glad you even collected data and you're so happy about it. (laughs) I got the interview on, thank God. I did it, I did it, you know. But then now I'm like starting to think about like, well, what did I do when I said I did it? (laughs) What did I actually do back then? You know, and did I really listen fully? And are there other ways that I could have heard somebody out? And maybe there is this point like where we ask, you know, where I think it'd be really a beautiful next step to Mm -hmm. be like, should we ask them if this is accurate? Should we ask them if we heard them correctly? Do we give them an opportunity to kind of shift the way we thought we interpreted something? Well, and there's there's methodologies to do that, right? There's like member checking and things where you mm-hmm. where you do sort of show your work uh, t- to the to the to the person under study and and kind of mm-hmm. investigate with them the extent to which your interpretation of events or your retelling of what they said kind of reflects what they mean. But that's something different about coming back to it, mm-hmm. right? Of, mm-hmm. of putting, like you said, you know, with the Henry Jenkins article, putting distance between yourself. In mm-hmm. this moment, and then yourself of who you are, who you've sort of grown to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I have done it a few times in different ways. So, one thing that I have done is I have like tried to make these like little videos where I culminate a lot of the data that I found and like some things that I've analyzed to show them. Oh, cool. Um, and then I would show it to them, and then they would comment and reflect back on it or give me feedback. And, um, and I actually loved it. Like I wish that cool. I wrote a whole paper about that part because yeah. it is it is so um they're brutal. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes they're not nice to me when I show them this video that I spent like a whole like 40 plus hours trying to make. Yeah. So I like show it to them. <laughs> and they're like, 
oh my god, this is like way too short. Like you didn't talk about all the things, and then more they would, of me. yeah, and then all the things that I spent time like juxtaposing all the artifacts that they made. The things that they loved were like Google images that <laughs> I found in like three seconds. They're like, how did you find that image of Roblox? How did you find Terrible. this? You know. And I'm like, oh my God, that's like not even the hard part, right? And so, but it was really interesting just to hear them. <laughs> they also had a take on things that I thought they said, right? Yeah, and my yeah. interpretations of what they were saying and like additions to that. So I think it's really fascinating just to yeah. get their take and perspective on some of these things. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So. Let's talk to somebody. Let's talk to a researcher. Let's talk to a researcher and a, and a kid they've done some research with and yeah. see how they think about all this. Wait, do we have one like that? <laughs> I sure hope so. Otherwise, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> okay, so in that light, the reason why we invited our next two guests, Tran and Sahana, is because I think that they did that. They did the things that we dreamed yeah. of, right? Like Tran had Sahana read an article that she wrote with some distance from the time of the research project. Yeah. And she also got feedback from her. And I think they have a relationship where they're able to kind of give each other constructive critique and the way that Tran hears it, I think is really lovely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think just to bring like, a whole season of thinking about relationships and especially yeah. intergenerational ones and how we have productive, thoughtful, respectful relationships with one another. We thought that we would investigate how these two people who came together under like, you know, obviously there's a hierarchy between adults and yeah, kids, yeah. right? But then how do two people come together and actually destabilize some of that hierarchy and then create like a different kind of relate, relating to one another, right? Yeah. We're going to start by introducing yeah. both of you. Okay, so we're really lucky today to have two very distinguished guests. Um, one repeat guest from our pod. So we like to call Sahana a friend of the pod. So we friend have Sahana pod. Narayan, friend of the pod, who famously coined the term, uh, what's poppin' art and avocados. So very, oh. very excited Famously, about that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and then we have... Dr. Tran Templeton, who is an assistant professor here of early childhood at Teachers College. And we're very lucky to have her here yeah. at the college at the and college. also on the pod. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're going to say. Okay. Um, so we thought, okay, so instead of you having to tell us more about yourself, because I know Tran never likes to talk about herself. So we thought we'd start with you just kind of talking about each other. So Tran, do you want to start us off? Like, what's something that you remember about Sahana? Maybe like some, when you first met her or just even like a really interesting story or something that stands out to you about Sahana? And don't cry. I won't. <laughs> Although I did almost do that when I was taking notes. Oh. <laughs> so Sahana, I met Sahana, I met you when you were two years old. Oh, wow in the toddler classroom at the Rita Gold Center, which is the child care center here at Teachers College. But I think one of the things that I remember most about you, are you anticipate, are you kind of nervous about what I'm going to share? <laughs> so since Sahana was two, one of the things, one of the ways that she communicated was through this really, really high pitched scream um, it was probably, it's probably the highest pitch that I've ever heard a human being um, manifest. Um, Sahana had this, so I, I, I'm hating it as this. I love gestures. So I love observing people's gestures. I'm studying your gestures as we speak. Um, and so Sahana has great gestures. And when she was two, one of her, you know, classic gestures was a finger sucking gesture, which, but not just any regular, because usually kids do thumbs uh -huh. or I don't know, what's another, you know, just putting, you know, Pinky. your two fingers. Yeah. yeah. She had this one where if you put your hand out um, in front of you and your, your palm is facing someone else, but then you take your first finger and then you put it inside your mouth. So you're kind of like it's kind of backwards. Yeah, back. it's kind of a reach back. I don't know. Can you still do that, by the way? Yes. <laughs> I would say that that's a visual memory of Sahana that I have. I have other 
salient memories, including her uh, obsession with the color orange. Mm. So she's to sort of forage the classroom, the world for objects that were that color. And she'd put them together in these really beautiful assemblages is what I call them. So that's, you know, two memories. I could share others, including her fear of toilet flushing. (laughs) Still? I, ha- yeah. I have to okay, note that Sahana is now that. rolling her eyes at you. Yeah. So for mentioning that yeah. one. <laughs> so do you still like the color orange? Yes. Sahana, excellent. And you could still do the back bend. Yes. Excellent. I'll, I'll also note that uh, when you were telling about the high pitched scream that our producer definitely reached over and got his hand on the volume just in case. <laughs> so. Do you still have that high pitched scream available? <laughs> I think so. (laughs) (laughs) I remember I didn't like when people, when people laughed because I always thought they were laughing at me. Oh Mm. yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that though. Cause I think that a lot of times too, I would actually in the middle of teaching be like, wait, are you guys laughing at me or laughing at a joke I told? Cause I can't tell. See, I usually have the other issue, the other issue where it's like, why aren't you guys laughing? I'm trying to be funny. No one is laughing. This is not. That tracks. (laughs) <laughs> but that is so, I do remember that. I remember when we would look at you and have some kind of, you know, exaggerated expression, like laughing or whatever it may be. And you, it did not make you happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nice. What yeah. about you, Sahana? What, what are some memories that you have uh, of Tran or maybe a story that you could tell us about your first experiences that you remember? There are so many stories that I still remember, but the one that always stands out to me is that time I asked you where you got your nail polish, Hmm. and you said Whole Foods. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, why is that funny? (laughs) We're not laughing at you, Tran. No, we're laughing with you. We're laughing with you. (laughs) Ah. That's good. I didn't even know they sold nail polish at Whole Foods. That's exactly what Sahana said. We actually have an audio recording of that conversation. <laughs> yes, we still have the video. Yeah. The data, yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we want to, um, we're super excited to have both of you here. And one of the things that we like to do to get started, to kind of get, get us kind of thinking together and, and laughing together, is play a little game. Okay, uh, so we have a little game for you guys to play this week. All right, so here's how this game is going to work. As Haney mentioned in the introduction, uh, you sort of famously coined this phrase, art or avocados, um, that is something that, that Haney and I have both repeated multiple times since. And so we thought we'd create a game where you had a choice, art or avocados. You, had, you have to make a decision at some point here. So I'm going to give you uh, a, a scenario, and each of you are going to respond of whether you you would prefer art or avocados. Okay. <laughs> well, this is a hard question. I know. Well, you don't art, even know the question. Art yeah. can art can make avocados, and avocados can make art. That is very very smart, and and you might be able to use that to your advantage here in answering some of these questions. Okay. So so here's the first scenario. You've just finished a long day of school or or work, and you come home. Which do you dive into first, art or avocados? Origami. So art. (laughs) Art. Art or avocado. Which do I dive into first? I'm usually famished when I finish work, so I probably would go for avocados. Avocados for you. Good answer. Okay, good. Um, Second scenario, you're stranded on a desert island and you can only bring one. Do you bring art supplies or do you bring a bushel of avocados? Avocados, because I'd get hungry. <laughs> I'd get hungry. A whole bushel, yeah. Mm. Uh, I would think that I could find other sources of food, so I would probably go for art supplies so that I can nourish myself that way. I mean, you could oh, always you wow. could always use a stick and then like draw in the sand. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you could be resourceful. Well, I guess you could be resourceful both ways. I'll allow it. You can, I'll accept both responses. I guess you could make, you could like make you said, art you with could, the avocados. That's yeah. exactly right. All right. <clears throat> Almost done here. So you're starting your first business. So the question is, do you make the world's best art store or the first grocery store that only sells avocados? Art store, because like... Not that many people would come for just avocados. It's like, <laughs> what, what do we need today? Oh, we're making tacos. Okay, let's, instead of going to the regular grocery store, which sells everything, we'll go to the just avocado store for the guacamole. 
That's a catchy title for your store already. Catchy, catchy business name. Just avocados. Just avocados. I like, mean, I'd like to point out that it's called just food for dogs, which is not a very <laughs> creative. I mean, but that's but, useful. But it works. That was really fun. Thanks for playing the game fun. along with us. Okay, so I kind of already asked you all this, like what you remember about the first time you guys met. And I think you also talked about like what you sort of appreciate about each other. So maybe over the years, so how long have you all known each other? How many years has it been? So you knew each other when Sahana was two. How old are you now? 10? Eight years. Wow. Uh, you known each other for eight years. Um, That's how long Haiti and I have known each other. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Can you talk about maybe how your relationship has changed? Because you used to be teacher student, right? And now you're something else, which I'm not going to try to say what it is, but maybe you could talk about how your relationship has changed over the years. What's different? I still wonder about that nail polish from Home Foods. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed other quirks that Tran has besides the nail polish? No. Because <laughs> there are none. <laughs> <laughs> so I am super normal. <laughs> Well, so I was your toddler teacher, then I was your preschool teacher, and then we did research together. Although I do wonder if you... And you took me to the cat cafe. I did. Yes, I actually was Sana's babysitter for a number of years. After? During Rita during, Gold uh -huh. and after, I believe. I think the last time I watched you was 2017. Then I moved away, so it was harder to stay in touch. I've stayed in touch with your mom. Um, I did watch you play guitar at a recital on Zoom while I was away. Oh, yeah. So our relationship, I guess, has shifted, uh, you know, in many ways. And, yeah, now that I'm back, I feel like we are you know, restarting a new part of our relationship, primarily because Sahan is older now. Yeah. And I, I sometimes wonder how much she remembers about my role because I feel like as an adult, we remember, especially as a teacher, a caregiver, we remember a lot more about children than perhaps children rem remember about us. Yeah. What do you, what do you think, Sahana? How, how has your relationship with Tran changed over the years? Well, I remember from like kindergarten, I used to, I used to see her more, but then I wasn't very happy when she moved, so. Uh, why not? No, because I liked her. Yeah. I liked seeing her every day, but then. You come to Waterworks. Then, <laughs> but then I did geometry, so. <laughs> yeah. I would say you've always done geometry, but okay. <laughs> so a, a big part of your, your relationship uh in addition to the many years that you guys were, were together was, was also the, the research that you mentioned that you did together. I wonder, could you talk briefly about what this project was about? Yeah. Um, so my research is in looking at how children represent themselves. I had been taking photos of children for many years as a teacher, and I realized that I never had handed the camera over to children themselves. And, right. you know, looking at the internet, you see just millions of images of children taken by adults. And I wondered, well, what, how do children present themselves to the world, right? What would the images they take look like? Would it look like the kinds of images that we see adults taking of children? So... This is inspired by one of my mentors, Wendy Luttrell, who does this with children and teens. And so I decided, you know, let's see what it looks like with young, very young children, two to five-year-olds. So Sahana was in the group um, that actually, um, that I conducted one of the studies. Hmm. Um, so Sahana, why don't you tell us, I want to hear what you thought was happening when Tran was doing this research. Like, what did you think you guys were up to? I mostly liked the camera, I remember. I li I liked walking around with it and just... Yeah. It was like... It's like when I was little, I thought everything was pretty much a toy. Uh -huh. So it's like this camera was just a bright, flashy toy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what's better for a little kid than a bright, flashy toy? <laughs> yeah. But I think it's like similar because you don't really see what, what you know, 
like what kids take pictures of because they can take pictures of all sorts of things that grown-ups wouldn't take pictures of. Mm -hmm. Because when grown-ups take pictures of kids, they're often like, okay, you stand in the middle, smile Mm. big. (laughs) Now, well, we won't move you near here because it's too dark here. And there's like this pile of garbage over here. We'll move you to the section with all the flowers and the sun is Mm -hmm. shining and the sky's blue and then we'll position it in the middle. And it's just not a very natural photo because (laughs) you don't smile with your eyes when you're told to sometimes. Uh They'll be like cheese and you don't really like smile with your eyes. So that's why like sometimes a photo that a grown-up takes is not as natural Uh as like... Um, okay, so Sahana, you said that you read the article that Tran wrote about you. Right. So Tran, how does it feel to have Sahana read your articles? Like, did you, were you nervous about it? Were you happy yeah, for her to for read sure. it? Yeah, for sure. No, I was definitely nervous. I, th- I sent you one of the first ones right after it got published. And I think you read it, but you were five. Because yeah. wow. Sahana actually is an early reader. So she just started reading when she was three. Do you remember this? And so just like walking through the city was very different with a three-year-old who could read. Yeah, I so, so I would look at that and then I'd be like, oh, danger. That means we can't go there. Yeah, yeah you really couldn't lie to Sahana <laughs> <laughs> because she could read the signs. <laughs> um, yeah, they're all out ice cream today on Wednesdays. No, it says it's open. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I de- was definitely nervous to see what she would think. But I also think that I try I try to represent the children in more ex, in expansive ways for the most part um, because that's my commitment, right, mm-hmm. is to, to kind of portraying children in the myriad ways that they represent themselves. So I was nervous, but not, you know, I wasn't scared or reluctant to share yeah. the work with her. And I think... Um, you know, when her mom texted me back and said, you know, we approve in so many words that certainly felt, it felt better than even getting it published or yeah. having people, you know, compliment it. Um, to hear your own participants speak to your work is like super powerful. Yeah. I think it's interesting because when sometimes when you write an article, you think about like your friends and family who will read this article, right? And you're like, oh, I'm so nervous. I should make this such a good article for them to read. But then so many other people read your article. Ooh. Except you sometimes don't think about that because you're thinking about the other people. This is Sahana. So She's deep. always <laughs> been a philosopher, even oh, at the no. age of two and three. Do you remember when you used to talk about yourself in third person? <laughs> If she had something particularly important to say, she would say, and she proclaimed. (laughs) (laughs) I really love that. Did I even know the word proclaim? Apparently so. I mean, maybe you were coming into understanding it because you were reading it in stories. Like Wallace and Gromit and Peppa Pig, or Uh, the Peppa Pig and um, Winnie the Pooh. (laughs) Yeah, I think Sahana also had a bit of an uh, an English accent when she was very young. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> because of the Wallace and Gromit and Peppa Pig I know, That's an excellent way to be raised. Nathan's about that's, to bust into English accent right now. Do you have a good English accent? I can I can do a Peppa Pig with uh, muddy puddles. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> muddy puddles. Uh, I can't do it. George. I used to be able to. Oh, that was good. <laughs> I don't want to go to school today. <laughs> Peppa always wanted to go to school, though. I can't remember Peppa saying, I don't want to go to school. Oh, well, that's, yeah. that's all Peppa I can think Peppa was of. always positive about everything she did. She was never like, no, I don't want to do this. Right. So, Hannah, it sounds like we need to do a Peppa Pig analysis. Like, I know. So. Sounds article. like that's what's popping. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is like actually a serious question. So... This is for both of you, so either of you can answer this, but what does it mean to actually listen to kids? So one of the, so our, all of, all this season and each episode, I think one of the takeaways is that, you know, we want to have more intergenerational relationships and that takes a lot of listening and hearing each other out because there's so many misunderstandings between generations, right? So what does it mean for adults to really listen to kids? Well, I think... I think they can often get like a new perspective because sometimes the grownups are like, they have a very 
fixed way of the of the thing the way they see the world so they're like this is this and this is that right mm -hmm. so it's like this rose is pretty and and this garbage is like weird and i don't want it here <laughs> and it looks bad but if but like the kid m might not say that you might say like well this rose could be pretty but it has all these thorns which are prickly and the prickly thorns aren't great mm -hmm. and then Look at this garbage. There are so many colors inside of it. Mm -hmm. Wonder what it is. So it's kind of like it could change the perspective that grown-ups have. Like they're mm -hmm. like, this is what it is. But then the kid would, could be like, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> that's such a complicated analogy too, right? Yeah, that you just, did you just think of that right now? Like the idea that like a rose could be so beautiful and we think that, but then there's thorns on it. So it yeah. could also actually hurt. And then garbage can be so disgusting, but then it can have a lot of colors in it. So it could actually be really beautiful. <laughs> did you just that. think of that? Did you just think of that? Yeah. Mm. I think that our roles should be switched. Okay. This should be the so assistant professor down. over write here. I know. <laughs> but I love that shifting your perspective, right? Yeah. And I agree. I think it's shifting your perspective and then adjusting yourself in light of what you are listening to and what you're hearing. Mm. Right. So that's not just okay, I heard you, but okay, I heard you. And here's what we're going to do to, to respond to that. Yeah. And, and it's not always possible to respond to what children tell us, as you know, as parent, a parent, um, but just keeping that in mind as a serious thing, right? Really treating yeah. their perspective seriously. Yeah. Doing that, I think is hard to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I really appreciate the the research that you've talked about and the and the ways you guys have discussed this because I think that's a it's a powerful practice to engage in when you take a moment to try to flip flip the flip your perspective flip your your view. Yeah, that was so delightful. Thank you so much for being here with us. Before we let you go, we like to end the show by asking our guests. Sahana already knows this. What's popping? So something that is out in pop culture land, it's a book, movie, whatever, whatever it is that you're really into right now that you think other people should be into too. So I don't know if other people would be into this, but I've been waiting to answer this question because <laughs> there's that singer. His name is like Rick Astley or something, right? And he's yeah. from like so long ago. <laughs> and, <laughs> and everybody's obsessed with him. I, I don't, don't know want why. to something, something. <laughs> I don't want to give you up. Oh, that's the yeah. one. That's that's it. And then I saw, and like everybody keeps singing it. I love that our last episode of this it's season so is a Rick silly because like, <laughs> Wait, because, how, how did you learn about Rick Astley? I don't know because because they all started singing it, and my teacher is like, "Why does everyone like singing this?" And they're like, "Oh, it was in some TikTok video." And then oh, no. <laughs> and then and then Miss Pick is like, "You do know that song's from the 1980s, right?" And then everyone's like. What? It's from the 80s? <laughs> so you're saying Rick Astley's popping. Uh, I don't know. But, but <laughs> I think he never stopped popping. I mean, he's been popping for decades. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Holy cow. I know. I yes. think that's actually a good one to end on. That's a good one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yeah, that's so great. That's going to be the closing song. Wow, that was unexpected. I didn't expect Rick Rick Astley to be popping. <laughs> that's why I was waiting for this that question. That is so amazing. Thank I you. I was waiting for this question. I love it. That was perfect. That was perfect. Never going to give you up. <laughs> Never going to let you, you down. down. So I, it's kind of in every school. This is such a perfect thing to end on because I feel like um, Never Gonna Give You Up is maybe one of the most intergenerational uh, media artifacts uh, that we could be talking about. Something that has existed, as you said, for multiple decades and it keeps having come, you know, uh, comeback after comeback. We have a new comeback apparently at your school. That's absolutely wild. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. All right. Thank you so much Thank to Sahana and Tran. We really appreciate this conversation. It's been fun. It's been a delight. Thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. Thank you. This season of Pop and Play was produced by Haney Yoon, Nathan Holbert, Lalitha Vasudevan, Billy Collins, and Joe Rena Ferry. 
and assistant produced by Lucius Von Joe at Teachers College, Columbia University with the Digital Futures Institute. Audio editing and production by Billy Collins. For transcripts and to learn more about our guests, visit tc.edu slash pop and play. Our music is selections from Leaf Eaters by Paddington Bear. Pop and play, of course, would not be possible without the fabulous team that helps put this together. Thanks to Oluwashon Animashon for running the Pop and Play social media accounts, where you should follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok under Pop and Play Pod. You can also follow us on Twitch under Pop and Play. Special thanks to Drew Reynolds, Jen Lee, Blake Danzig, Brianne Minato, Moira McCavanaugh, and Lucius Vonjo, who all helped with our outreach and our website support. Shout out to Ioana Literat for the Trashies. Watch on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.